creation, man and woman, marriage, procreation, and eternal destiny. These are five truths that have been, in one way or another, attacked since the beginning of time, but in today's world, the onslaught has become intensely heightened. The Darwinian evolution of the 19th century contradicts the biblical account of creation. Over 80% of U.S. adults say humans evolved over time, with a full 33% who fully deny the biblical account of creation saying there is no involvement by God. Today's transgender ideology distorts, and even destroys, the reality of man and woman. Compared to five years ago, 62% of Americans say they are more supportive of so-called transgender rights. The acceptance and legalization of gay marriage redefines a God-given sacrament. Support for same-sex marriage is at a record high, with nearly 70% saying it should be legally valid. The abortion mindset, in which contraception plays a key role, aims solely at pleasure, leaving no option for procreation, and even obviously, destroying it. More than 60% of U.S. adults say it should be legal in all or most cases. And among self-described Catholics, that number is virtually the same at 56%. And the many branches of atheism, as seen in Marxism or humanism, deny man's destiny being eternal and supernatural. This has caused Christianity to plummet in the U.S., going from 77% to 65% in just 10 years. And it follows that the religiously unaffiliated group has shot up going from 17% to 26% in just 10 short years. Theology of the body, as first proposed by Pope John Paul II, traces its roots all the way back to the very creation of man. Theology is a science, as it's the study of God. And under that science, there are many different dynamics or aspects, with our material bodies being one of them. Although this part of theology finds itself at the heart of another science, anthropology, which is the study of humans, Looking at humanity with regard to its supernatural end is why it's under the umbrella of theology. Over the recent decades, the phrase became more well-known around the world, largely due to the work of Pope John Paul. This work contains a compilation of 129 Wednesday audience addresses over a period of several years from September 5, 1979 to November 28, 1984. His work consists of many different topics all centered on the theology of the body. Analysis of the biblical account of creation, man and woman, a gift for each other, the unity and indissolubility of marriage, analysis of knowledge and of procreation, the kingdom of God, not the world, is man's eternal destiny. On the biblical account of creation, the first utterance of scripture reads, in the beginning God created heaven and earth. Opposing this most basic truth of not only faith, but also natural reason, was Charles Darwin and his infamous theory of evolution. As is a requirement of subscribing to this theory, Darwin viciously opposed Christianity, saying in his autobiography, quote, I gradually came to disbelieve in Christianity as a divine revelation. He continued and referred to the biblical teaching on hell as a damnable doctrine. Darwin's bulldog, as many called him, was Thomas Huxley, who called the, quote, enemy of the highest intellectual, moral, and social life of mankind, the Catholic Church. In defense of Catholic doctrine, on the other hand, was St. Pope Pius X, who in his famous 1907 encyclical on the doctrine of the modernists, in which he defined as the synthesis of all heresies, named evolution as, quote, among the chief of their doctrines. Charles Darwin did not wrestle with science. He wrestled with faith. He sought an alternative explanation to the straightforward words of Genesis, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemaim et haretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He didn't establish a new science, but rather a new religion. There are some who try to marry belief in evolutionary theory with the faith. They call it theistic evolution. In effect, this creates a new, new religion, replete with irreconcilable differences. For example, the doctrines of original sin and salvation presuppose an original father and mother, an Adam and an Eve. Pope Pius XII spells this out in his 1950 encyclical Humane Genities. For the faithful cannot embrace that opinion which maintains that either after Adam there existed on this earth true men who did not take their origin through natural generation from him, or that Adam represents a certain number of first parents. Another striking contradiction, most versions of evolutionary theory claim dinosaurs were wiped out, dead, before humans even existed. But expounding on the faith, St. Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. These differing positions on death cannot both be true. On the topic of man and woman as a gift for each other, again in the first chapter of sacred scripture, God says, male and female, he created them. 
The attempt to erase male and female is a more recent doctrine that over time, the left has now fully embraced. The idea that an eight-year-old child or a 10-year-old child decides, you know, I decided I want to be transgender. That's what I think I'd like to be. It may make my life a lot easier. There should be zero discrimination. The fact is, masculinity and femininity have been under attack, not even just from the second wave of feminism, but from the first wave of feminism. The, getting women the vote, getting them out in the political realm, was a means to usher in the second wave of feminism, which was to equalize the laws in society to get them out of the house, which was ultimately ordered towards breaking down all barriers and all distinctions between the sexes. First, second, and third wave of feminism are all prongs of the same fork and they're all evil. To attack transgenderism, you have to destroy feminism. And that's really hard because again, you're talking about changing people's wills, not just their intellect. On the unity and indissolubility of marriage, Pope John Paul notes that when the Pharisees asked him about this, Jesus referred twice to the beginning. Our Lord then emphasized that God made them male and female. In 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled 5-4 in favor of gay so-called marriage. And this landmark ruling, the court uh, making same-sex legal, same-sex marriage legal in this country across every state in this nation. The attempted dismantling of the sacrament of marriage is widely accepted in America and in many other parts of the world. On top of this, inside the Catholic Church, which definitively teaches that marriage is a vocation only between one man and one woman, and more so, teaches that homosexual acts are of grave depravity and are intrinsically disordered, there are many clerics who openly contradict these truths. There is no other phrase, as far as I know, other than objectively disordered and intrinsically disordered, which refers to, alternately, depending on what you're reading, the sexual orientation, the sexual act that has made people, LGBT people, feel so marginalized, uh, so less than, so subhuman. Everybody understands that gay marriage is uh, disgusting, despicable, disordered. But the fact is that marriage has been under attack for 60 years, and it was fundamentally redefined when we got no-fault divorce, which said that marriage is an impermanent thing. The first no-fault divorce law in America came into effect in 1970, under then-Governor Ronald Reagan. This enabled all California residents to gain a divorce virtually on demand. You have these three criteria. One is the permanence, the other is between a man and a woman, the other is between two people. Well, we've seen the first two criteria be redefined. It's no longer permanent, now it's no longer between a man and a woman, and obviously what's coming next is it's going to be, the two-ness is gonna come under attack, which we're already starting to see. But I resent and I hold in contempt those who were happy to go along to get along when marriage came under attack at first and the permanence came under attack. Um, of course now, in this most heinous way, this most heinous um, attack on the marriage as between a man and a woman, that's really troublesome and everybody should be up in arms. But it's like, where were you when the precedent was being set for marriage to be redefined in the first place? On the subject of procreation, since the first century, the church has affirmed the moral evil of every procured abortion. Also following what the church has always taught, Pope Pius XI condemns contraception in his 1930 encyclical, Casti Canubi, saying those who use it, quote, propose sin against nature and commit a deed which is shameful and intrinsically vicious. These two intrinsic evils were legalized in the US in 1965 and 1973 under the so-called right to privacy, which is a phrase found nowhere in the constitution. The clerics who dissent on this teaching hide their opposition under the seamless garment, a phrase coined by the Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago, Joseph Bernadine, in 1984. The erroneous proposition equates all life issues. This line of thinking puts the slaughter of innocent children on the same plane as immigration, racism, unemployment, and the like. I am pro-life and I am against abortion, but I want to be very clear, I think we have narrowed what we define as abortion. We define abortion as something that happens in a womb in a clinic. If we believe that every single one of us as children of God have a destiny, a purpose, and a plan ordained by God, then when a child is not allowed to reach his or her destiny by education, by poverty, by racism, that's abortion. That is abortion. Interestingly, in 1984, the year, not the dystopian novel, Cardinal Joseph Bernadine borrowed Eileen Egan's phrase, seamless garment, in a talk titled, A Consistent Ethic of Life. 
The idea is that topics from abortion and capital punishment to war and economic injustice must all be approached equally for one to truly value the sanctity of human life. The theory is not an actual teaching of the church. Insisting one must place the same emphasis on economic injustice as tearing children apart limb from limb is irrational on the natural level and dangerous on the supernatural one, as the church distinguishes clearly between different types of sin that bear different measures of gravity. Our Lord established the church to save souls from the fires of hell and bring them to eternal glory with the Holy Trinity and the kingdom of heaven. The church is not merely a social organization in need of a so-called consistent life ethic in this passing world. None of the corporal works of mercy like feeding the hungry and spiritual works of mercy like admonishing the sinner are about realizing an earthly utopia, but rather are all oriented toward the life of the world to come. The only seamless garment of interest to the faithful is the wedding gown of grace that adorns those destined for eternal face-to-face -face union with God. In Pope John Paul's section titled, The Kingdom of God, Not the World, is Man's Eternal Destiny, he teaches that man cannot become too attached to the goods that are linked to a perishable world. This truth is attacked by the atheistic views of Marxism and humanism. Both philosophies, for the most part, deny the existence of the supernatural. In doing this, a utopia, or heaven on earth, becomes the goal, since heaven cannot ever be achieved in the next life. Rejecting God and the truth of man's supernatural end, Karl Marx said, we do not transform earthly questions into theological questions. We transform theological questions into earthly ones. And with humanism, the philosophy is a little less hidden as its motto is good without a God. 